Victor Adeyemi is the senior pastor of Global Harvest Churches with branches in Nigeria, United Kingdom, and South Africa. He is widely traveled and has been to lots of nations for the sake of the gospel. A man with a heart for evangelism, he travels internationally and nationally, preaching and teaching the word of God and ministering healing to the sick. The host of the television program, Transformation Today, he is committed to church planting, organization of crusade and conferences, and publishing of books as an outreach outlet for his fast growing ministry. He is pastor of pastors with several spiritual sons in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. As a spiritual mentor to many, Victor Adeyemi is committed to seeing individuals discover, develop, and deploy their potentials so that they can fulfill their divine assignment. He is married to Jumoke Adeyemi, who remains a strong support to him in ministry, and their union is blessed with four lovely children. With a standing ovation, Make welcome Come on. the ministry of Ladies and gentlemen, he is also a Victor grandfather. Adeyemi. Sorry, we forgot to put that in. The letter's grandfather. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Let's give Jesus the loudest praise. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you very much, choir. You guys are wonderful. Glory be to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers who are under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Let's also take a second reading. And this second reading will be from Psalm 133. I love it. Psalm 133 is known as a song of ascent. And some of you will see that in your Bible, that it was a song of ascent. Don't forget that all those Psalms were actually songs that were written, a whole lot of them, by David and then Asaph, and there were some other authors who wrote some of the other Psalms. But when you see a song of Ascent, um, it's a very wonderful song, and I like the picture of it because it's a song sung when the children of Israel gather together in Jerusalem for one of the festivals. And as they are going up on, mount, on the mountain, on the temple mount, to go and worship God, they go hand in hand singing songs like this together. And this was one of the regular songs that they sang. I wish I knew what it sounded like thousands of years ago when they sang it. But even just the lyrics of it are so wonderful. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garment. It is like the dew of Hammon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. By the grace of God this morning, I'll be preaching on what I've chosen to title, Our Corporate Inheritance. Our Corporate Inheritance. Father, we ask you to anoint the ministry of your precious holy word today that you will anoint your servant to teach it, you will anoint your people to understand it, and that at the end of the day, Lord, we will make quality decisions concerning what we are about to hear. We do pray, precious Lord, that fresh oil will be the, unction, will be the portion and the experience of next generation worship center and of each and every one of us this Pentecost Sunday. To you be the glory, honor, and adoration in Jesus' name. And everyone says a loud amen. I love this very wonderful song of ascents together. How good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together, to live together in unity. And he began to describe this unity uh, as, as like the ointment that came upon Aaron 
Of course, Aaron, the brother of Moses, was the first high priest to be anointed. And uh, the, he was anointed so generously. This particular uh, psalm is, is showing us right now that that anointing so poured on his head that in quantity that it ran down his beard. And I can imagine he must have been a heavily bearded man. And, but it did not stop at the bed. It ran down to the very skirts of his garment. And he says that the flow of that anointing is like the dew of Haman. And if you understand Israel, it's quite a hilly place around Jerusalem. And um, you find these hills from one level to another. And the dew of Haman is a dew that settles upon this very wonderful hill uh, and, um, uh, o and overnight. And as the sun begins to rise, you see the dew melting and the waters washing, uh, you know, beautiful uh, deposits of, of, of silt down into the valley. Uh, because of the minerals in the rock that it is washing down in the morning as the waters flow down. And whatever is planted, is planted in fertile soil. And it is very productive. So he said, dear God commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. There's fertility in the soil uh, that, that, that are around and in the valley that is around the mountain of Haman. And what he's saying is, there's so much life there. Everything you plant there is so productive and flourishes. And what it's trying to say is, wherever we find unity and oneness, that is the kind of blessing that we find there. Now notice this, when we're talking about our corporate inheritance, I'm talking about the corporate anointing. There are three types of, of anointing. I couldn't uh, bring my resources, my books this time on this trip, but I, I, I think that should be one of the books that can be found on Amazon.com right now. I have a book titled The Anointing, and I explained in it three types of anointings. There's an anointing upon us. There's an anointing within us. And there's an anointing without. The anointing upon you comes upon you for the purpose of service. Service. It supernaturally equips you to serve God. Like I'm, an anointed, I'm anointed to preach and to teach the word of God, so I'm able to stand to do so. Not everybody is anointed to preach and to teach. You can be anointed to speak. You can be, I'm sorry, you can be um, talented to speak, but it is different from being anointed. A person who is talented to speak can stand up and speak. He can make good comedy. He can make a nice speech, but his speech will not win souls. His speech will not break yokes. His speech will not heal the sick. It is somebody who is anointed uh, to preach and to teach God's word that will be able to break open the seals of the word of God and bring about understanding to the human heart and also be able to produce such super natural results. So, uh, I have an anointed upon me to preach and to teach. Okay? There's an anointing within us. The Spirit of God dwelling each and every one of us and helping us to live our Christian lives. And then, however, there, there, now, those two anointings are personal. There's a, there's a kind of anointing upon my life. There's a kind of anointing upon Dr. Andrew's life. There's an anointing upon your life to serve God. What is upon us differs from person to person. And the anointing that is within you is within you personally for your own personal Christian life. However, there is an anointing without or a corporate anointing, something given to the entirety of the body of Christ and some particularly to certain local churches. Some to particular Christian ministries. For instance, Pentecost happened about 2,000 years ago. A little over 2,000 years ago. The Bible tells us in Acts 2 verse 1 that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind and it filled all the house where they were seated. And there appeared unto them clothing tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each and every one of them. It sat upon each and every one. Everybody. So it's a corporate experience there. And till today, everybody who gives his life to the Lord Jesus Christ has the opportunity to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So what was poured out upon the church on the day of Pentecost is our corporate inheritance. Somebody say out loud, say the Holy Spirit is our corporate inheritance. Now, because he is our corporate inheritance in the body of Christ, he is not the preserve of one denomination or another denomination. Some denominations, when do you belong to them? They don't want to have anything to do with any other denomination. <laughs> 
And, 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 and I like what Dr. David Oedekwe said to myself and some others years ago. He said, I think it was to myself and my brother specifically, he said to us some years ago, he said, thank God, the Bible says when the rapture will take place, we shall all be changed. He said, because if we don't all change, there will be a lot of fight on the flights. He said, some people are going to say, Lord Jesus, no way. This guy cannot make it on this flight. He does not believe in covering the hair during worship. That one does not believe in washing the feet. The other one <laughs> said, no, this, they, no, they cannot go on the flight today. He said, thank God we shall all be changed. <laughs> Hallelujah. So this Holy Spirit is our corporate inheritance. He belongs to all of us in the body of Christ. I can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Anyone who wants the Holy Spirit can experience him. Wonderful. But at the same time, we've discovered uh, that there are also peculiar graces and anointings upon churches. In fact, this thing is also typified by the 12 tribes of Israel. By the time you study the invocations and prophecies of Jacob, his blessings over the children of Israel, and you also, uh, you know, and you also look at that of Moses, you will discover that the tribe of Reuben is described as the very first, and there's tremendous power with the first. It represents powerful energy. Paul, I'm mean, sorry, Moses said, uh, uh, I'm mean, sorry, Jacob said, Reuben, you are my firstborn, the beginning of my strength, the excellence of dignity. Something about the firstborn that puts responsibility on the firstborn, that gives the right of the firstborn. And then you see Simeon, who is described as a powerful aggressor. The, the Simeonites will fight. They, 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 those guys could conquer any territory. Levi was the family of the priests, and so they were the clerics of the day, of Bible days. Those guys were anointed for ministry. Judah was described as the leader. Jacob said that the lawgiver will not depart. He said the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and until Shiloh shall the gathering of the people be. Of course, Jesus is described as the Shiloh there, and, 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 and Judah, whose name is Praise, was going to be the leader. Out of that tribe of Judah came David. Out of that tribe of Judah came Jesus. So you see leadership in that family. You see Dan, his name speaks judgment. So you see justice there. You see grace there for justice. Naphtali is a free spirit. God is a warrior. Asher, the prosperous one. Issachar, the scholar. Zebulun, the business people. Joseph, the, the, the sufferer who became, who became uh, the, the broken into two tribes at the end of the day. Ephraim and Manasseh. He got double for his trouble. And you see, see the tribe of Manasseh is a tribe of reconnection. Ephraim the transformer. Benjamin is described as a ravenous consumer. Different descriptions of these tribes. And, and I don't have time because of time. I'm just going to skip explaining and expounding on the uniquenesses of each tribe. Because their uniqueness is even translated into specializations in vocation in the tribes of Israel. Uh, because of different graces poured upon them. But I come to the New Testament, and I want to lift up a few churches in the epistles. The first one, my favorite of all the churches. I wish all the churches of Global Harvest around the world can just be like these guys. And that is the Philippian church. All oh, the Philippians are my favorite. They were also known as the Macedonians. These guys were talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. From verse 1 by the Apostle Paul. He was writing an epistle to the Corinthians, encouraging them that they should learn to give. He was raising offerings in the Gentile churches at that time for the church at Jerusalem because the church at Jerusalem was undergoing a terrible famine. And because they had resorted to communal living earlier, where everybody had sold their property and they put their money in a common purse, they were all broke at the same time. And so Paul had to take on the responsibility of raising resources from the Gentile churches to support the church at Jerusalem. And in writing to the Corinthians, he began to use the Macedonians or the Philippians as an example. Macedonia is a European nation, still exists till today uh, in, the middle, uh, in, the, in the Mediterranean. 
And at that time, the capital city was Philippi. I don't know what the capital city is today. But the capital was Philippi. And so they were known as the Philippians, but they are also the Macedonians. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 from verse 1, I see Paul said, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now I want you to notice, he said, the grace of God. So whatever these Macedonians did was a result of the grace of God. And he said this grace was bestowed on them. In other words, this was something supernaturally imparted on the church of Macedonia. It was something that even though everybody had the Holy Spirit in all the churches, but it made this church unique and distinct. And you see, if you look at it today, you do a close examination in the body of Christ at large, you will discover that from denomination to denomination, there are peculiarities. There are peculiarities. Even where you have evangelical churches, you see some peculiarities. If you come into the Pentecostal churches, there are peculiarities. Some churches are known, when you know them, they are very much known for financial prosperity. Others are known for miracle signs and wonders. Some churches are known for holiness. You will just discover some peculiarities to each church. That there are certain uniquenesses to them. There are certain um, graces that are that are just unique to those churches. So it says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded to the riches of their liberality. Four things were listed up here, and they are very funny. How these four things could mix together, I don't understand. It looks to me like two of them ought to be on one side, and then the other two ought to be on the other side. Look at those four things again. He said, how that in a great trial of affliction. So these guys were going through affliction. They were going through a lot of persecution at that time for being Christians. And then he now mentioned joy. When people go through persecutions, they ought to be sad. They ought to be sorrowful. But these guys had joy. Joy in the midst of slander. Joy in the midst of imprisonment. Joy in the midst of their church buildings being closed up. Joy in the midst of weeping. Joy in the midst of some of them being killed. And yet they were rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory. He takes grace. It is the grace of God. It's the river of God flowing in their midst. Psalm 46 verse 4 says, There is a river of God. The streams we are of shall make glad the city of God. In Isaiah 61 verse 3, there it says, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, beautiful ashes, the oil of joy, or the anointing of joy for mourning. This kind of joy is supernatural joy. It is not based on happenings. And next gen, that is your portion. Like the Macedonians have it, you have it. Come rain, come shine. You will sing the victory song. Even when you walk the lonely road, you will still be singing the praise of our God. Even when you walk the lonely night, you will still be clapping your hands and you will still have your dance on. Nobody around you will know what you are going through because it's a supernatural joy. Hallelujah. Affliction. And yet there was joy. He now said again, and the are deep Poverty, my goodness. These guys were very poor. That is, does not sound to me like a Canadian church. Well, if you want to find poor churches, you come to Nigeria. You come to Africa and you can find poor churches there. <laughs> Glory to God. Because he's talking about deep poverty here. These guys, he said their deep poverty abounded to the riches of their liberality. How can people be poor and generous at the same time? The Macedonian church was poor and yet generous. You say, how? Generosity is an attitude. Oh, yes. I found of rich, stingy, rich people in this world. They've got the money. They just can't spare it. Some will go to their graves with all the money. They find security in keeping it all to themselves. They are not like the rich people. 
uh, that Timothy said, uh, that Paul told Timothy to raise in his congregation. He said in First Timothy chapter 6 verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, not trusting on certain riches, but to trust in the living God who gives us all things freely to enjoy, that they be ready to distribute, willing to communicate. That the reason why God has blessed them so much is that they might take care of those who do not have. This Philippian church, I'm uh, sorry, this Macedonian Philippian church, yes, there were people who were poor and yet generous. In ministry at times, I found friends in ministry tell me how much they enjoy to come and minister in Nigeria. They say, you Nigerians are generous. Nigerian churches, generous churches, despite the poverty in our nation. They still find generosity in our nation. They still find support. It's like the American church. The American church is a generous church. I remember my brother getting on television in America years ago. He said, I made no provisions whatsoever yet to have partners, financial partners. So they did not have that provision whatsoever to get financial partners in, 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 in their ministry as at that time. And guess what they were doing? He said, people were sending us checks. They were sending checks to the address of the ministry. The ministry they didn't have a bank account to put the money at that time. But the American church was sending checks. Come on, this guy's blessing us. Come on, take this check. Take a hundred dollars. Take a thousand dollars to support the work. Amazing. That's generosity. Glory to God. Whereas that same brother of mine has been on television in Europe for many years. Even after Hughes and Christ, hardly was he getting the checks. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Praise God. Next year. Next gen is a generous church. He said, For I bear witness and according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we will receive the gift. In other words, this is a church begging Paul, we want to give. <laughs> they don't have to wind them, they don't have to send, go hire machineries like some people do to come get the money. No, freely out of their heart, they were begging to give. Awesome. Now, we love the Philippians, don't we? Because if I want to ask for one of your favorite scriptures in the Bible, I am sure it is Philippians 4.19. Next gen, do you know Philippians 4.19? What does it say? It says, but my God shall supply all my needs according to his in glory. Now, I caught you there. You see, every congregation I've gone all over the world, when I tell them to quote Philippians chapter 4 verse 19, they quote it exactly the way you just did. They will say, my God shall supply all my need. And it does not say so. I challenge you, you got it wrong. Can somebody please put that scripture on the screen for me? Philippians chapter 4 verse 19. Glory to God. Are you sure? Before they put it on the screen, I'm waiting for it to get on the screen. But before it gets there, do you want to correct yourself? It says, but my God shall supply. <laughs> Thank you. It says, all your need, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. But because it's such a favorite of you, you've been personalizing that verse for many years. Every time I ask you to quote it, you say, all oh, my needs. And that sounds so good. It just shows me that you are somebody who confesses the word of God. Hallelujah. And the word works. I said the word works. I said the word works. When you meditate on it and you declare it like that, it sure works for you. The Lord, God should supply all you on it. It was the Philippians he was writing to. It was this people who in the great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep Poverty abounded to the riches of their liberality. If you check Philippians chapter 4 there, you will see the same thing about these guys. In verse 13, Paul said uh, that no church had communicated to him concerning giving and receiving except you. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again to my necessity or to my needs, we'll say the New King James Version. 
In other words, this church, apart from the fact that they were supporting the poor, there were people who sent offerings once and again to the needs of the Apostle Paul to partner with him in ministry. No wonder he later said, not because I desire a gift in verse 17 of Philippians 4, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. And then in verse 19 he said, but my God, but my God, because of your giving once and again, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. And I stand here as a servant of the Most High God without any sense of contradiction whatsoever, with all the authority given to me as a minister of the gospel. Next gen, you who have given to the building project. Next gen, those of you who have been supporting the work of the ministry. Next gen, I say, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Let me hear you say the Lord as Amen. He will supply for your building projects. He will supply for your personal housing projects. He will supply for your car notes. He will supply for you to pay your school fees. He will supply for you to send your children to school. He will supply for you to have shelter over your head, clothes over your back, to fund your vision, to fund your own purpose, to finance every endeavor that God has put into your hands. You will not be hungry. You will not be needy. You will not beg for bread. You will not suffer for money in the name of Jesus Christ. Shout it louder, amen. amen. These Philippians were a bit different from the Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3, we are told concerning them, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. These guys were known for character. They were known for being, for being full of the love of God. Their faith was big in God. And they labored in love for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ as a result. And they were patient in hope. Even when the results were not coming quickly, they were still patient and persistent. In the midst of persecution, they were still patient and persistent. By the time Paul will write the second epistle to them, look at his words again in chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. The faith of these guys was growing rapidly. Notice that in all the epistles, Paul commended the various churches for various reasons. He described them for various reasons. I think it was only the Galatian church that really didn't get such con much con commendation. Instead of that, we hear, oh foolish Galatians, in Galatians chapter 3 verse 1, oh yeah, what they got was a serious reprimand because Paul couldn't believe it. These guys, he had, they had received the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They had received the Holy Spirit without circumcision in the flesh, without having to submit themselves to the ordinances of the Old Testament, but faith in the finished work of Jesus alone. Suddenly certain Jewish teachers came around them and told those guys, you can't make it to heaven unless you are circumcised. Oh, you guys, man. When was the last time you killed your Passover lamb? Without your Passover lamb, you cannot be accepted by God. Suddenly, they began to mix the gospel. And it turned into another gospel. Paul was now reprimanding them. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you to depart from the living God before whom Jesus Christ was clearly, you know, you know said and clearly demonstrated as crucified. This only will I learn of you received you the Holy Spirit by the hearing of faith or by the works of the law. Or was it by the works of the law you received the Holy Spirit or by the hearing of faith? Oh, Paul was just so concerned about these Galatians and reprimanded them. But most of the churches he commended. But notice the commendations, how unique they were. Because those commendations told us something special about them. These guys had been commended because they said, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 1.3 that he remembered without ceasing their work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. He's writing a second epistle to them right now after some time, you know, had passed after some years. And he says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other. Loving church! So that we ourselves most of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. The three things he commended them for in the first epistle, he's commending them for in the second epistle. It was their faith, it was their love, and it was their patience. A church that had character. Oh, I see next gen as that church. A church that has character. 
one of the things I love about this church and the excellent example your pastors are giving you is that even though it is full of young people, it is not full of immorality. It's a church that I can boldly send my children to so that they will be nurtured because you have the right examples in this house. Let's give God the glory and the praise. There's no news, a reputation about you, about town. The next gen, it, there's no reputation of, there are filthy people there. No! Good character, good reputation. To God be the glory. Let's see one more church, and then that's the Corinthian church. This church is one of my favorites in the New Testament. They were very interesting people. Quite comical. Now, Paul, however, said this about them in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 4 to 7. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God. Somebody say grace of God. You say it again. So this is the grace of Just like the Macedonians had the grace of God to give, these ones also had the grace of God. Now, their unique grace, look at how it manifested. He says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you are enriched in everything in him. In all utterance and in all knowledge. These guys, they had utterance. They could preach. They could teach. They could speak in tongues. They could prophesy. He said in all utterance and then in all knowledge. These guys had revelation knowledge of the word of God. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So that you come short in no gift. Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. All the gifts of the spirit were in manifestation in this church. They had faith, they had healing, they had working of miracles, they had word of knowledge, they had word of wisdom, they had discerning of spirits, they had all the gifts of the spirit. You, I describe this church as the charismatic church. Anointed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Next gen is a charismatic church. Hallelujah. Gifts of the spirit flowing freely here. Yeah. But guess what? This is the problem with this Corinthian church. By the time you get to chapter 3, verse 1, you see Paul says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes, we are, whereby there are envyings and strife among you. Are you not yet carnal and behave as mere men? Charismatic but carnal. They were charismatic but lacked character. Thank God next gen is not like that. But I just want, but you see, they had the grace of God. So Paul now had to write them a letter correcting their character problems. That was what he devoted 1 Corinthians to doing. But I want you to notice something. That these peculiarities were peculiarities of the entire assemblies. These local churches had it. You see, what was upon the grace of God that, that was upon the Corinthian church was something that every member of the Corinthian church enjoyed. What was upon the Thessalonians, all the Thessalonians enjoyed together. What was upon the, the Corinthians, all of them enjoyed together. What was on the Philippians, they all enjoyed together. It was their corporate inheritance. There is no local church that is a church of Jesus Christ where you will not find such corporate inheritances. In fact, national churches also have it at times. You come to Nigeria, what an apostolic nation. Sending her missionaries all over the world. You got to Ghana, what a prophetic nation. Nigeria has prophets, Ghana has more. Of course, the devil counterfeits the original. So both good and bad are being exported all over the world. Just like it is in Nigeria too. Anything God is doing, you see, the devil also tried to counterfeit it. But the prophetic anointing is strong in the Ghanaian church. You see prayer, you see pro prophecy there. Now, you look at denominations at times. We have a denomination in man of God just walked in just now. And in their denomination, they are very well known in Nigeria for the prophetic and for prayer. If you belong there, that grace flows through the ministry. I was, described, I was discussing with one of my friends with a background from that denomination some time ago. And he said to me, he said, it is a very strange thing for you to belong to the apostolic church and, uh, and you want to make a major decision in your life and you don't get prophetic confirmation before you do it. 
He told me how he started the house fellowship one time in an area of Lagos, in a very rich area. Then the members of that fellowship started telling him to come and start a branch. He said, I shut down that fellowship. He said, because I'm not going to allow you to get me out of the will of God. He said, anybody genuinely raised in our midst does not want to be outside the will of God, not for one minute. He said, we fear God and we don't want to step outside of his will for our lives. He said, it took God now speaking to him when he was seeking God on an occasion that he should go and, go and resuscitate that fellowship and plant that church. It is my will. It was when he heard from God that he now went to do it. He said, divine direction and prophetic confirmations are very crucial for us. We take no step except we hear, thus say yet the Lord. It is a grace upon the house. Prophetic grace. Prayer and the prophetic is what you find there. Some other churches, you will find the miraculous. There is no global harvest church where the sick does not get healed, for instance. It's a cooperate inheritance. Very often, what happens usually is the gift and the grace that is upon the leadership of the house becomes amplified to become a corporate inheritance. Let me hear somebody say amen. amen. That's why it's very crucial who your pastor is. You don't just decide to just go to any church anyhow. <laughs> you go under a man of God who is anointed and whose anointing has a positive effect on your own life and ministry. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen? And when you go there, you get planted there. Look at what I read in our text. Moreover, brethren, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 from verse 1 again, the text we first read. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. So, this cloud of glory that the children of Israel saw that led them when they were going into the promised land was a corporate inheritance. All our fathers, he said, were under the cloud. And look at what happened because of that cloud. That cloud protected them. When the host of Pharaoh were coming, that cloud moved from the front of them, went behind them, gave them light for their journey, darkness to the host of Pharaoh, made their journey light for them, made the chariots very difficult to drive for Pharaoh and his hosts, maintained a safe distance between the two of them throughout the night, between the Jews and the host of Pharaoh. Divine protection. Covenant security by that cloud. By the time they got to the other side, then God said, Moses should stretch his hand over the sea. And that cloud made sure that the sea buried the enemies of Israel. That's the way your enemies will be buried in the name of Jesus. All the challenges of position rising up against you today, we declare annihilated in the name of Jesus Christ. But all the children of Israel enjoyed that cloud. Pillar of fire by night, pillar of cloud by day. Protected them from the rays of the sun at day. Gave them warmth in the coldness of the night. Made things comfortable for them. And this cloud of God's glory followed them throughout their journey. In the hour of need, God brought miracles and met their needs and brought provision through the presence of that glory cloud. That cloud was a cloud of God's glory. It was a type of the Holy Spirit. He said, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses. Now, I had to like baptize into Moses. Lord, what is the essence of emphasizing they were baptized into Moses? People were baptized in water. Which one is this baptized into Moses? To be baptized is to be immersed. Now you're saying that they were immersed into Moses. I thought Moses was just one man going ahead of them. They were immersed in the cloud. And he already said that they were all in that cloud. These guys were baptized in the cloud. But I now came to understand they were baptized in the cloud because they were baptized into Moses. It was because of Moses that the cloud showed up. You see, when you are in Covenant, or you join yourself and get membered to the leadership of an anointed person, then his spiritual experience becomes your experience. If you have doubts, let me ask you this question. If Moses had not stretched out his rod over the sea, will the sea have parted into two? 
If these people did not believe in the leadership of Moses and decided to stay in Egypt, let's imagine half of them say, Moses, we don't believe in you, and they did not follow on the journey, will they have been able to walk through the sea? It was the people who followed him that experienced the parting of the sea into two. They were baptized into Moses. They were yoked with the leadership of Moses. And that was why the same anointing that was upon him, the supernatural power of God in operation through him, benefited all of them together. Let me hear somebody say praise the Lord. Very, very crucial. Now, I'm not preaching this message to exalt a human being today, but I want you to see spiritual dynamics, how God operates let, let me give you an example, one of the scriptures I was not even planning to use before. Philippians chapter 1, and I'll take the reading from verse 6. I want to point your attention to one scripture there, spiritual chapter 1, and then from uh, verse 6, Paul said, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work will complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, in as much as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. You all are partakers with me of grace. Actually, in the Old King James Version, it says, you all are partakers of my grace. Through Paul, and through their connection to the Apostle Paul, they had come to partake of the same grace. That Paul was partaking of. It is a corporate inheritance. I want, to, I want to give you an example of it for you to understand it a little bit better. First Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5. Wow. Sounds like some deep teaching, isn't it? <laughs> That's why I wish I had, had three hours. But I'm going to start rounding up shortly. <laughs> I wish I had three hours. To really slowly teach it systematically. Amen. First Corinthians 5 from verse 1. Um, hmm. Because of time, I'm wondering. Okay, let me just read. Let's enjoy the reading. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. This is the Corinthian church. Those guys who did not come behind in any gift. Very charismatic. But those guys lacked character. And such sexual immorality as it is not even named among the Gentiles. Even not unbelievers who are not even saved. They don't even practice this one. That a man has his father's wife. Lord have mercy. I think the man, the man was a polygamist. Here comes this son, shocking up with his father's young, younger wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this thing might be taken away from among you. Now, some people don't believe in discipline in the local church. And the moment the pastor is bringing in discipline, they get offended and leave. Some get angry and start fighting against the leadership. A church that does not have discipline is not a real church. It's not a healthy church. Just like a family without discipline is not a healthy family. Christians ought to be taught that it is right that there is discipline in the house of God. If you misbehave or you commit immorality and your pastor says step down from office, step down with all humility, submit yourself and know he is doing it in love. He loves you. Parents correct children that they love when they go wrong. <laughs> Parents that don't correct their children don't love their children. You want your children to turn out right? You discipline them when necessary. Thank God in Africa we still have the right to spank them. And we do to the glory of God. Our parents abused it, but we, we do it with balance these days. But we do. And thank God for those of you who do in secret. <laughs> I hope you don't hear that on TV and deny me visa next time. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you discipline them because you love them. You send little kids to the naughty corner because you love them. I like disciplines like isolation. The children had to be isolated. Especially the friendly ones. I said, come and go to your room. <laughs> come and go. You are not coming out here. Some can't watch television for a week. Good discipline. Because you love them. 
pastors who love their church members discipline when necessary. This Corinthian church, they were just walking around with indifference as if it was okay for the guy to be doing what he was doing. Nobody cared. So Paul was now like, hey, for I indeed as absent in body but present in spirit have already judged. Look at Paul. Because of his apostolic authority over this church. This church was connected to Paul. And look at the words of Paul there. He said, for I indeed as absent in body but present in spirit. Because he carried them in his heart all the time. He sensed in the spirit what was going on in the churches. Then he said, he said, I already judged as though I were present him who has, done, who has so done this deed. He now said in verse 4, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, my spirit is going to be there. Like the spirit of Elijah came to rest upon Elijah. Uh, Elisha. What, when I, I may not be there physically, but every time you guys gather together, my anointing is there. It has become your corporate inheritance as a church, uh, as Corinthians. My spirit is going to be there with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost is there. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I'm like, why? Why deliver him to Satan? Then I realize, oh, by belonging to the Corinthian church and by being under the apostolic covering of Paul and of that local church, Satan couldn't touch him. Satan couldn't touch him. The hedge of God's protection was around him because he belonged to that house. Tap your neighbor and tell your neighbor you are covered. Hallelujah. You are covered together with us by belonging to this house. The corporate anointing upon this house covers you, helps you, strengthens you, aids you in your own personal spiritual experiences. <laughs> hallelujah I said hallelujah hmm. some of you don't know when you are praying for your pastor you are praying for yourself indirectly there is power when we are connected together there is power in our agreement and in our unity listen to me friends Without unity, there are certain things we cannot access in the realm of the spirit. So this brings me now to talk about the, the keys to enjoying this corporate anointing. The first one is unity. We have to learn to be united. When a church stands as one, they enjoy the anointing of the Holy Spirit to the maximum. That's why I want to beg of you. When you are offended... By your pastor, by your leader in your department, by another fellow member, please don't waste time immediately make moves towards reconciliation. Let's keep the church of Jesus as one. You see, because at times we don't understand, this thing is not a club. You see, if it were a social club, we can be offended at one another and it won't affect the corporate welfare of the organization. It's a club. It's just a human social gathering. When it is church, it's a spiritual body. Every time there is offense and malice between myself and my brother, it creates what is called a breach in the spirit. There is, it, it affects the flow of grace among us when we are not united. It stifles the spiritual atmosphere. It limits the blessings we all enjoy together. It affects us together. That's why Paul said, if you read further in that 1 Corinthians 5, he said, know ye not that a little leaven leavened the whole lamp. You guys, this guy is sinning. You guys are looking the other way. You're not doing something and correcting the guy. Don't you know that his sin is going to affect everybody else? One person's conduct affects the others. That's the reality. And at times, when somebody is walking out of uh, you know, walking disorderly, if it's not dealt with very quickly, it's going to start polluting other people. 
and the, the person becomes a negative influence on other people. That's why he said very quickly, get rid of that guy out of church. Because very soon, somebody else is going to be shacking up with his own father's wife too. If you don't get him out of church. That's why if one person is in rebellion, if the rebellion is not dealt with quickly, you will just see a company, a group of people in rebellion together. And the moment it looks like three people are thinking the same way, the tendency for the next person that is exposed to their rebellion is to think three people cannot be wrong. And so very easily, a big company is being built and they are all wrong. The days of Korah, Dutton, and Abiram, they were not a small number of company of people who are wrong. And yet they were all wrong. The fact that a number of people are saying so does not make it right. It doesn't make it right. Are you listening to me, somebody? So let's learn to reconcile quickly. The Bible says we should follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. And then one of the ways where we, where, where, that we, we, can, we can be disunited as a house is through division. Do you know the word division is from two words? It's from die, which means two, and then vision. There ought to be only one vision in a house. And that is a vision that the man of God over the house declares. When the man of God says, this is what God is telling us to do. That is the direction we are all to go. When there is a dissenting voice, that dissenting voice is creating a breach in the spirit. God is a God of order. Wherever you find equals. Listen, look at your pastor and his wife are equals before God. Dr. Andrew is not a greater human being than Pastor Yankat before God. No, he's not greater. However, there is a first among equals. Because God is a God of what? Order. He is not the author of confusion. That's why even in a democracy, there is one man that is the most powerful person in the nation. And he is given wide executive powers. Otherwise, nothing works in that nation. There must be companies... They may have their board of directors, but there's one guy called CEO. He's chief executive officer. He is the most powerful person in that place. Except there is a lot of power like that in the hand of one man, there's confusion. Except the people are not brilliant people. Otherwise, when you gather 10 people, it should be 10 ideas. David Yongicho says, gather, when you gather one Korean, when you bring one Korean to the table, three ideas. Automatically. <laughs> He was making a case for strong leadership. That for them to be able to raise the largest church in the world, that one of the key was strong leadership. The people allowed him to lead. And he gave examples of that strong leadership. He said one time he wanted to plant a church in Japan because he went to preach to Japanese pastors and told them churches could grow. They laughed at him and said, churches can grow in Korea. In Japan, churches don't grow. He said, I decided to shame the Japanese pastors. So I took a woman who had raised a large house fellowship, a house fellowship leader in Korea, and I sent her as a missionary to Japan. He said the woman was a widow. He said she cried in my office for two hours. He said, I have my children here. Please don't send me. Find a man to send. He said when she was done crying, I said, are you done crying? Okay, I'm sorry, but you don't disobey, pastor. Go to Japan. And she went to Japan. He said in one year, she had raised a church of 200 people. He said it had never happened. In Japan before then, he said, I shamed the Japanese pastors. Then I brought her home back to her children. After that, that is strong leadership. Eh? A woman is crying in your office. You are like, oh. you are like, when you are done crying, let me know. But you don't disobey pastor. What a strong leadership there. <laughs> he said, another time, I went to Taiwan. And I preached church growth. Taiwanese pastor said it was impossible. I decided to shame the Taiwanese pastors too. I didn't send a man. I looked for another widow. He said, when you have difficult places, send a woman. He believes very much in women. And he sent a widow. He said, that one to cry in his office. He said, when she was done crying, he said, are you done? You don't disobey, Pastor. You have to go. Peter, Peter Wagner. I, what, I don't know if he's still alive or he's gone home to be with the Lord. S still alive. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Peter Wagner, he's a professor of church growth, Fuller Seminary. He said, he said, from many years of missiological research, we've discovered that the responsibility for church growth is 50% that of the pastor, 50% that of the congregation. 50% that of the pastor alone as a person, 50% the congregation. When he told Yongicho that, David Yongicho there, he said, Peter, I disagree. 
He said, I agree with Peter on most issues. He said, on that one, I disagree. He said, it is 51% pastor's responsibility, 49% that of the congregation. <laughs> <laughs> he said the pastor must be a strong leader. The pastor must be able to give instructions and the people will be. The people must honor their pastor, respect their pastor, and submit to his authority. It is my opinion that if you don't trust your pastor, you should leave his church. It's my own opinion. I think you are doing yourself a great disservice by being under a man of God you can't trust. So here you are, you cannot trust him, and you now go behind him and gossip against him. And what you are doing to the body of Christ is not good for you. Because you are now hurting other people who want to unite with him and get the job done. And it is not good, it's not healthy for you spiritually that you are under leadership that you cannot trust. I tell our church members, if you cannot trust me with your tithes and your offerings, it's better you go to another church. Instead of listening to all these guys ranting on social media. I mean, just leave and just go elsewhere. Praise God. If I've been pastoring this last 30 years and you believe that I've been a thief all, all these 30 years, what are you doing here? I don't want to be pastored by a thief. I've never joked with my destiny like that. Put myself under a thief? No. So if you know your pastor is not a thief, then be faithful to commit your resources in that local assembly. You just heard this man talk about wanting accountability and putting people like me on the board of trustees. I've been in ministry for so long, there's nothing I'm looking for that will make me not be able to speak the truth to Dr. Andrew Bauer. God forbid me not speak the truth. When I find people who don't want to hear the truth from me, mentees, I stay away from them. You see, we're either close and we can speak the truth to one another or we don't relate closely. But for me to become a hypocrite, God forbid. Why? Why should I be a hypocrite? It's uncalled for. So whenever you see honest people, they are the people who ensure there's accountability on their board. I'm on our board, my wife is on the board, but we have a greater number than the two of us on the board for, for purposes of balance and accountability. And I related well enough with your pastor to know he's very accountable. Praise God. It's very easy to just carry stories about pastors. Trust me, we have capacity. Whatever makes a man be able to lead a congregation by the anointing and manage resources so well that the church is so young, the church is owning our own property, trust me, he has integrity. And he's a good manager of resources. And I think it's a good place to clap and celebrate your leaders once again in this church. Hallelujah. Somebody say Unity. Acts 2 verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. If there was no one accord, the Holy Ghost wouldn't have shown up. Churches where there is no one accord are not anointed churches. And when the church is not anointed, everybody there will not enjoy the benefits of that anointing. One accord. Look at Acts chapter 2 and look with me at verse 46. This one accord thing again. And look at the benefits of being in one accord. Growth does not come except they are in unity also. The Bible tells us now in Acts chapter 2 verses 46 to 47. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple. And breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who have been saved. When they were in one accord, you see church growth. When there is no unity, you don't see church growth because it is in the place of unity that God has commanded the blessing. According to Psalm 133. How good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the ointment that came upon the head of Aaron that ran down his beards and went down to the skirts, even, even to the very skirts of his garment. For there, it is like the dew of Hamorn. <laughs> oh, glory to God. It, 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 it says, for there God commanded the blessing. I see the commanded blessing of God mightily upon your lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Like the dew of Haman descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. Life forevermore. Zoe of God. The life of God forevermore. Flowing in the united house. I see the life of God flowing in this house. It's been flowing. And it's going to flow in greater measure. In the name of Jesus Christ, let us all unite. There was there, there, there's, there, there's, 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 this problem at times. Look, that people have serving under people that they think are not as qualified as they are. The 
That's another challenge we face in church. The pastor appoints somebody or the church board appoints somebody to be the leader of a department. <laughs> you look at the guy. I'm older than the guy. <laughs> I have master's degree. He's only got a diploma. Now, you, you feel you are more qualified. Yeah. If you understand leadership, leadership is not position. Leadership is influence. And in his book, The 360 Degree Leader, John Maxwell expounded how you can lead up, lead sideways, lead down. You can lead people below you. You can lead colleagues on the same level with you. You can lead people who are positionally above you. Because true leadership is influence, not position. When people follow you because of your position, people follow you because they have to follow you. You're not a real leader. And that's why John Maxwell also propounds the five levels of leadership. And he says, the very first one is position. But you must move from position to permission. In permission, people follow you because they want to follow you. And you will notice, take such people away from position, the people continue to follow them. They continue to listen to their voices because they have influence. Don't be position focused. Be influence focused. If they put somebody there above you, honor the person. Respect the person. And then you will get the buying of that person to listen to your brighter ideas. Simple. Hallelujah. But don't, don't because of that now start discrediting that person. Creating a click in the department so that the pastor at the end of the day will remove the person. Wrong leadership or wrong spirits expose the weaknesses of other people. I say, Pastor Shaw does not know that the weaknesses of this guy, that's why they put him in a position. I will expose him. That spirit is not the spirit of Christ. The Bible tells us that Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation and humbled himself unto death, even death on the cross. And the Bible says in Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He wasn't inferior to the Father. He submitted himself to the Father. He wasn't inferior to the Holy Spirit. He submitted himself to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He, he created Joseph and Mary. He submitted himself to their leadership and then now submitted himself to death. He, the author of life himself, submitted himself to death, even death on the cross. That's the right spirit. It's a spirit of submission and God will exalt you. As a God will exalt you. The second key is united prayer and fasting. You, you, when, we, when a prayer meeting is called or a corporate fast is called in a church and you do not participate, at the end of the day, you are not contributing to the corporate inheritance. Just like a personal Christian life cannot do without prayer and fasting, so is it with a church. A church has to pray and fast together. Acts 1.14, the Bible tells us there, how this one accord thing started. This all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Prayers and supplication. That was what they were doing in one accord. So when we are united, let's gather together at the prayer meetings. When it's time to fast, let's fast together. Now, the power of releasing or enriching the corporate anointing is in the togetherness of the exercise. So never ostracize yourself and like, well, they are fasting in the church. <laughs> and then you pull yourself out of it. No, if you're really going to be a member of the church, participate in the prayer meetings. Participate in the fasting. Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together, look at that together, was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Somebody said together. Thirdly, corporate praise and worship. Yeah, just like we, we, we need to participate together in prayer, we also need to do the same in praise and worship. When you come to church, my brother, it matters that you are participating with us in the worship. Don't be quiet and be looking at all of us and then judging all of us. Then this one is always exuberant. Look at it, jumping up as usual. Look at the other one. Only one dance step all the time. How are you able to notice everything going on like that? Because of lack of participation. <laughs> Rather than criticizing everybody, please participate with us. That's why I want you to know. Some of you who work on some very simple things don't know the importance of them. 
Like displaying the lyrics of songs on screens. When first time guests come into this house, they are not familiar with the songs you sing. But they're able to sing along as the lyrics are displayed. It's one of the things I love about your church. I come here, I don't know all the songs you sing. I've learned several songs in this church. I thought some of them bless me so much. I pull out my phone, I quickly record the song so that I can go teach them back at home or tell them, tell my choir, look for this song. At times, I'll send a video ahead of me. <laughs> Praise God. Send a video ahead of me home. Look for this song and let it be sung by the time I get home. Praise God because the song is so anointed. Now, when we participate together, that is when the glory of God is released. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13, at the dedication of Solomon's temple. The Bible tells us there that as the voice of the musicians became as one, the glory showed up. It says, indeed it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord was filled with cloud. Hallelujah. Those guys who come up stage here leading the singing, they are not here to entertain you. No, they're not here to entertain you. So don't judge their dance steps. Participate. What they want you to do is sing along with us. We are here to help you to sing to worship God. The reality is when we truly worship God, if it's true worship, God cannot help himself. He inhabits the praises of his people. He said in Psalm 50 verse 23, he, he, who, who, he who offers praise glorifies me. In John 4, Jesus said in verse 23, Now are the true worshipers come to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. The Father is looking for true worshipers. And whenever he finds true worshipers, his presence just manifests. When his presence manifest miracles, signs, and wonders take place. Somebody say amen. That's why we need your participation. Make up your mind. Every time you come to church, I will participate in the praise and the worship. And please, whoever is in charge of the lyrics, make sure you get them all ready. Don't give us lyrics for some songs and then not give us for some other songs. We need it for every song. Our participation is what matters. Rookie worship leaders at times, we read songs nobody knows, prepare no lyrics, and then they are just enjoying themselves all by themselves, worshiping and having a one-man choir, just having a great time all by yourself, and all of us are watching you in your ministry of entertainment. And your ministry of entertainment cannot help us, cannot bring the glory down. Hallelujah. I said Hallelujah. But when the lyrics are there and you are connecting with us and we are singing together, God cannot help himself. I don't know. One day I was asking God, what is it about agreement that excites you like this? And I think it is because agreement and corporate participation reflects the inherent nature of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons in one. So, he says, if two of you shall agree on earth, as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father who is in heaven, in Matthew 18, 20. So, I'm like, but I can ask personally too, and it shall be done. <laughs> so, what is this two or three thing about? He said, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I said, Jesus is getting more confusing. Already as a born again Christian, I know you are inside me. Colossians 1 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. How many of you have Jesus in you here? Say praise the Lord. But now Jesus himself says, if two of you shall agree together as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father who is in heaven. For we are two or three of you are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. I said, so what's the difference between you being in the midst of me personally and them being in the midst of us in agreement in your name? And he told me, he said, it is in the measure of my manifest presence. It is in the measure of the anointing. He said, when you come together, he said, my glory in manifestation becomes more intense. It, that's why one shall put how many to flight? A thousand to flight. One thousand to flight. Two shall put how much? There is a multiplier effect 
in agreement. And it is because it reflects the nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the agreement they have among themselves. That's why if there's anything Satan hates, it's a husband and wife praying together. United, he will fight tooth and nail to create chaos, strife, to make sure you guys don't pray together. Especially get your husband uninterested in prayer. And you, instead of you, to react with gentleness and understand this is a spiritual battle. You too, you will not start fighting him. Say, I, 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 I thought I would have a spiritual leader for, for, for a husband in this house. I, I, I don't know, it's, it's a baby, I will have to be pampering that, that I married. When you insult me like that, and I'm a man with my ego, I will never pray with you again. <laughs> Praise God. May God give women the wisdom to talk to us. It's just the way we are. Listen, God wired a man, and he, he, that ego thing is wired into him. There's nothing wrong with him. He's just, he's just been a man. The way he is designed, the greatest need of his life is for respect. That's why you will notice him trying to remind you that he is the man in this house. I, I am the man in this house. As if, as if he's not sure which sex he is between male and female anymore. It is when he's threatened that he talks like that. <laughs> he feels insecure. And you can help him feel secure. There's nothing, that, well, there's not a marriage seminar, so let me get out of this. <laughs> when a man feels secure, there's nothing he cannot do for a woman. When he just feels settled and feels secure. So it's a skill you learn as a wife to make him feel like that. You're like, but I respect him. God knows I respect him. Does he want me to worship him? No. You, uh, you will respect him, but he does not feel respected. You see, it's one thing for you to respect in your heart. It's another thing for you to have the skill uh, to make him feel respected. Are you listening to me, somebody? It's just the same thing. You will not, so that's why wives, what did God tell the wives? Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. Because... God knows what he needs is respect. And God knows what you need to as a woman. Husbands, love your wives. You see, many are like, what, what, what is your, this problem? Like, 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 like I, don't, I don't love you and so on. If I don't love you, why, why will I marry you? Men live in the area of logic. Mr. Man, it's not enough to love her. She must feel loved. So you have to learn and acquire the skill to make her feel loved. She's got to feel it. She's got to feel it. When a woman feels love, submission flows. There's nothing he will, there's nothing she will not do for that man. <laughs> she must feel loved. As the man must feel respected. Glory to God. God knows feeling loved is really not so much of our own headache. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> uh, it's not that we don't want to feel loved, but it's not really so much of our own headache. You know, when we feel respected, we feel loved. As far as we are concerned, the definition of love is respect. <laughs> when you respect me, you love me. When you don't respect me, you don't love me. That's the way we read it, we men. And it's the way we are wired. It's just the way we are wired. And the woman must feel loved. The, she must feel your affection. She, she, it's not enough for you to love inside. You must express it. I know you are an introvert. You don't like talking. You must talk, sir. You must say it out of your mouth. You must talk. You must talk. I know, I know your parents never hugged you when you were growing up, but excuse me, sir. Practice it till, till it becomes a part of you. Hug, kiss, peck, touch, rub the back. The average woman needs to be touched eight times in a day, says psychologists. I'm so, so start counting. Start counting. Pastor, I'll be back for marriage seminar next time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, let me remind you of the words of Peter. <laughs> Somebody say agreement. Say unity. Say, at next gen, we are united. Say, in my family, 
we are united. In our department, we are united. In my home, we are united. Let me just quickly read that word to husbands in verse 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together. Somebody say together. Of the grace of life. The grace of Zoe, the God kind of life. That you received and you accessed personally as a believer. The moment you joined yourself to a spouse, the two of you became one. Now, there are certain blessings you don't access alone anymore. You access together. And once there is no unity between the two of you, you don't access them. A divided house limits the blessings that they can receive from God. It says that your prayers be not hindered. Once there's this unity in the family, hindrance comes to your prayers. How many people want their prayers to be hindered here? <laughs> Nobody. Then let there be unity. And that principle runs through even for a congregation. When we are divided, we can achieve our corporate goals as fast as we were achieving them before. All my contributions towards the unity of the church I belong to by making sure that I'm submitted to the authority of my pastor and to the leaders he has put over me, except when those leaders are not submitted to his authority. The moment any leader is not submitted to the pastor's authority, you have every right to rebel against that leader in order to be submitted to your pastor's authority. Let me explain the principle to you. It's like a wife is submitted to her husband's authority. And first lady here, she's submitted to her husband's authority, but I know her. The day pastor tells her to steal money in her place of work, she will say, you're on your own. I steal never. I was not raised to steal. She will disobey him in order to obey God. And she will be right. Are you following me, somebody? You only can disobey your pastor rightly if your pastor is disobeying God. If, if your pastor tells you to tell a lie, he's disobeying God. So you don't follow. But for as long as your pastor is not telling you to sin, and he is following Jesus, you are to follow him. Now, if any leader does not follow him, pastor says, let's go this direction. That leader says, let's go the other direction. Then, say, excuse me, sir, that was not what the pastor said. Confront that leader under the pastor. Because that leader is about to create division in the house. And a breach in the spirit. That can, tell him, tell him that kind of behavior will affect all of us, sir. We need to be united. If you think pastor is wrong, then take the matter to pastor and go and tell pastor about it. Let's do everything in our power to keep ourselves united, to keep ourselves working in love. In every single unit of the church, from the rank and the file of the church, we all will enjoy the benefit together. God bless you. Rise to your feet. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. Let's lift our hands and worship the Lord together. Hallowed be your name.